you would turn your Bibles to John chapter 17. We want to read verses 14 through 23 as we begin. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 14. Hear now the word of the true and living God. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as you, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. Let's pray. Lord God, the prayer of the Lord Jesus continues to ring in our ears and his plea to you for unity stands as a challenge even for us today. But as we look into our own history within Churches of Christ, we pray that we would learn the lessons of yesterday so that we can move forward into a tomorrow which is indeed sanctified Amen. unto you. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We left off talking about the, the split, the division. 1906, the formalization of a drifting that had taken place for decades even prior. We chronicled some of the events that led to that. Tonight, we want to bring this just about right up to almost today by looking at the trajectories that further establish the Churches of Christ as its own movement. In 1906, we had the split from the Disciples of Christ, and now you have the Churches of Christ. There are several key figures who help us to solidify the things that we believe in regards to a number of different things. And we're going to talk about a few of those uh, men tonight, including the peacemaker, who will be T.B. Laramore. T.B., by the way, anyone know what T.B. stands for? Theophilus. Theophilus so Brown Laramore. The pallbearer is Foy E. Wallace Jr., who's come up in our discussion already, and we're going to talk more about him this evening, because he has a tremendous, a substantial influence upon us as a movement. But we want to begin with a review before we advance the ball. Uh, we, we have these competing traditions that we talked about last week with the Tennessee tradition and the Texas tradition. You also had the Indiana tradition, but that kind of gets marginalized as these two become kind of the dominant strains. And then even among these two, one of them becomes the primary uh, view within Churches of Christ, popularized by Foy Wallace Jr., uh, R.L. Whiteside, C.R. Nickel. Uh, but uh, you have the Tennessee and the Texas traditions. And I pulled this from the Stone Campbell Movement of Global History uh, that, that chronicles the history of our movement uh, in that volume. And so this, I found this paragraph, and it, it really breaks down the differences that existed. 
theologically, ecclesiologically, eschatologically, salvifically, all these different ways in which the Tennessee and Texas traditions differed. In the Tennessee tradition, you had the church. The church is the manifestation of the kingdom. It's not the kingdom exclusively, because, uh, as Scripture teaches, that God rules over everything. But the church is a particular manifestation of the rule and reign of God in history. In the Texas tradition, no, the church is the kingdom, and the kingdom is the church. In the Tennessee tradition, the, the hope for the end of time was a renewed earth. According to the Texas tradition, the earth would be annihilated and it would give way to this spiritual heaven. According to the Tennessee tradition, there was the belief in the personal indwelling, the personal presence of the Holy Spirit in every Christian. According to the Texas tradition, no, no, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer representatively through the Word, through the Bible. The difference in the preaching, Tennessee, very Christ-centered, and, and by that, the emphasis is upon what God has accomplished in Christ. In the Texas tradition, I say human-centered here because it, it focused on the task of preaching was just the, the plain presentation of what it is you have to do in order to become a saved individual. When it came to the Tennessee tradition, the view of the church was what had a, had a had a deeper social dimension than it did with the Texas tradition, and that gave way to different aspects concerning ministry and mission. For the Texas tradition, when it came to the church, we are focused on the marks of the true church, and you have your five acts of worship, no more, no less, and you have your church governance, elders, deacons, preacher, and yeah, we really focus on those true marks of a true church. And then when it came to baptism, the Tennessee tradition viewed baptism as uh, representing our trust in God for salvation. Whereas in the Texas tradition, baptism, that's where you, you have to do that in order to obtain salvation. It was, uh, and again, that, that read back into the preaching in those respective traditions. So that's a review, but also kind of a condensation of, of the differing views. And I think as we work through these here, you probably recognize some of these uh, within your own upbringing in the Church of Christ. Absolutely. Of these two, which one do you think won out? Texas. Texas. Yeah, that's 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 where I grew up. I I recognize that very clearly. So uh, those were the competing traditions. All right, let's advance the ball a little bit. Meanwhile, in Tennessee, it has been two years since the global pandemic came to its conclusion. The Spanish flu had wreaked havoc the world over. It had killed millions of people, and they kind of had their own crisis, kind of like we did, and you know, what do you do with uh, those who are infected and masked and all that stuff had come up to the forefront 100 years ago. But here we are in the fall of 1921, and there is a desire to return to some semblance of normalcy. And that was felt and expressed among a number of churches in the Nashville area. And so the leadership of these several churches got together in September of 1921 and brainstormed how they could reach their community with the gospel. And what came from that was uh, this idea of uh, a citywide evangelistic campaign. Committees were formed in order to, you know, focus on how we're going to finance this thing, advertisement, who are we going to get to speak, who are we going to get to lead, uh, who are we going to get to lead singing, who's going to locate the venue for this thing. And over the course of several months, all those things are worked out. Over 150,000 personal advertisements go out across the city. It is advertised in the paper uh, time and again. The speaker is identified as one N.B. Hardeman. N.B. Hardeman. N.B. standing for? Nicholas Brody. That's right. Nicholas Brody Hardeman. That's what I was going to say. I, I, it was right on the tip of your tongue, I know. 
The song leader is going to be one C.M. Polyvas. He's the minister for the Murfreesboro Church of Christ. And on March 28th, 1922, the very first session of what will be a three-week-long evangelistic campaign begins in Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. Here are the results. There, counting was a difficult thing. They thought either six or 8,000 people were crammed into Ryman Auditorium that first night, all of them uh, in their Sunday best. 2,000 people were turned away at the door. It was a phenomenal success just from that standpoint. But then N.B. Hardman got up and preached the first lesson, which was about the Bible. Uh, Hardman was was one of these uh, old school guys who, it, no notes, but he knew exactly what he wanted to say and how he wanted to say it, and he got his point across. Here is uh, N.B. Hardiman here, the basic vital statistics here, a three-week evangelistic campaign. It started on March 28th, ran all the way to April 16th of 1922 at the Ryman Auditorium, Nashville, Tennessee. Six to 8,000 attended, 2,000 turned away. Newspapers would cover the event and then would publish the sermon immediately. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, Hardiman would return to Nashville the following year. Uh, this, again, it was a smashing success, but it was in 1923 that Hardiman solidified himself as, well, some call him, called him the Prince of Preachers among the Brotherhood established his reputation as not only a skilled and eloquent preacher, but a trainer of preachers as well. Uh, I believe we have a school by that name. <laughs> Freed Hardeman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it, in 1923... Actually, they gave me this one for free. Nice. Well, I mean... Ain't nothing free in, in 1923, they had the second of these, uh, they become the Hardman Tabernacle Sermons. But also that year, Hardman engages in debate on the subject of musical instruments with Ira Boswell. And it is the debate in the second of the Tabernacle Sermons that solidifies Hardman's reputation within the Church of Christ. He returns in 23, 28, 38, and 42. The product of this is a five-volume set of books. I believe you can still get your hands on them. Uh, you can access, I think, all of them online. I was I pulled up number one, number five earlier today. We'll let you borrow them if you want, because well, Pat has them. I read them all. Okay, yeah. You... I thought it was interesting that they had a special section roped off for the blacks. Yeah, well, I mean, you're in Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. In the in 1920s. Yeah. The volume, five volumes, 125 sermons. It is these sermons that it, they, they still have influence today, 100 years later, right? Uh, these codify what will become what we believe within Churches of Christ. But that's just one aspect of this. Uh, the other aspect, uh, Buddy's going to talk about at this time. <clears throat> so we move ahead uh, from 1922, we move to 1929. And this is a critical moment in Christian heritage, but instead of being in Tennessee, we move out to California. We go to Santa Ana, California, and on that day, T.B. Laramore is going to the grave. T.B. Laramore has, has uh, fulfilled his obligation in this world and in this life to preach the message, and he's been called home by God. But as T.B. Laramore is being laid to rest, there was a young man there that was a pallbearer at his funeral. And that was 
Foy P. Wallace Jr. And it's, it's a, a juxtaposition. It is an intersection. It is, uh, it is a moment in time that I think we can look at because the trajectories of movements are starting to change. See, choices uh, have consequences. We have a peacemaker and a pallbearer. A mental leadership is going to be passed uh, from one generation to the next. And the impulses of the movement are going to be garnered by those who are leading it. The man whose memory was being honored had drunk deeply from the waters of the Blue Hole. And when we talk about the Blue Hole, it's, uh, we're referring to uh, a book by Jack Reese. And the Blue Hole is uh, a spring of water that comes up near San Antonio, uh, Texas, uh, deep from the uh, Edwards Aquifer and, and just brings fresh, crystal clear water. So why should we notice this moment in history? Even better yet, why, why should we even care? You know, typically when preachers pass, uh, they're not necessarily momentous occasions in the larger scheme of things. Because after all, people live and people die. And after all, in uh, the other scheme of things, this happened a long, long time ago. After all, it is just history. But why should we notice? Why should we care? Why, uh, why can't we just rush past this? What we need to do is just linger a while. What we need to do is slip back into the church house as the funeral begins and see what we notice there. Who are the people that are there? How did they understand church? And where did their views come from? While the funeral marked a significant turning point in these churches, there have been many turning points that have happened and we have talked about many of these. But in the years after the Santa Ana funeral, in cities and towns in the United States and even abroad, the lessons that are going to be passed on to the next generations and the next generations continue to make choices. Some parts of history had been shaped by, by the movement that were celebrated by these churches. Other parts were suppressed. Other parts were forgotten. Some fires uh, from the past were stoked. And some were doused. What we do know, though, is in 1929, the conscious identity of the church in this movement was not quite 100 years old. And in the early 19th century, these churches had come together almost helter-skelter. And when I say helter-skelter, uh, we go back to Cane Ridge and people barking like dogs. People having what was called the jerks. Uh, we had people that were running as if they were running away from the devil himself. And coming out of that movement, there was no founding vision. There was no grand design. There was no denominational organizational plan. And even though it is commonly referred to today as the Restoration Movement, the Stone Camel Movement, it was not even single group. And that brings us to who we were uh, burying that day. Nick, could you look in my bag and see if there is a white, I don't think, well, ne never mind, we're, we're not going to, uh, if you'll get my laptop out of there, eventually this is going to die. I can see that happening right now. It's only got 10% power. So T, uh, Theophilus B. Laramore, 
Now, he was a great speaker. He was a, a, a speaker uh, that was very gentle in nature. But it was not his style or his disposition to gauge in controversy or to be offensive in his preaching. He chose his subject and presented it in a straightforward fashion. He wrote no books, but yet a number of books were written about him. Uh, and these books are as follows. Uh, as, as follows. Uh, Laramore and His Boys and Letters and Sermons of T.B. Laramore. And then also Maine to Mexico and Canada to China. He had a storied career. On his 21st birthday, July 10th, 1864, he obeyed the gospel. He began preaching in 1866, and in the fall of the same year, he entered Franklin College near Nashville, Tennessee. He remained in school at Franklin College about two years, uh, and then started preaching. He was chosen to deliver uh, a valedictorian address at his college. And then he went to North Alabama and started preaching with much power and much persuasion. His next move was to Florence, Alabama. And on June, uh, January 1st, 1871, he opened a school and called it Mars Hill Academy. And he continued there for a few years until he changed the name to Morris Hill College. Morris Hill College continued for a period of 16 years, from 1871 to 1887. Laramore conducted the school six months out of the year, and six months of the year, he actually went on the road preaching. Hundreds of young men were trained in this college by Brother Laramore. Oddly enough, uh, if you're wondering how much it costs to go to this particular school, it costs $130 a year. Hardly affordable at that time. $130. But you got all of your living expenses taken care of. Your clothes, your food, your place to sleep. This is a picture of the Laramore uh, home, which housed the school. Uh, and it was on the National Registry of Historic Places. Uh, it was placed there in 1974. Oddly enough, though, this house burned down in 2018. Laramore would preach anywhere he had the opportunity. He preached in schoolhouses, under brush arbors, and in log cabins. He baptized hundreds of people and established many congregation in the hill country of Alabama. Perhaps he preached more sermons uh, to more hearers and baptized more people than any other preacher of his day. He traveled extensively in Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Arkansas, and Washington, D.C. He preached from Maine to Mexico and from Canada to Cuba. His two longest meetings. I think we're actually going to be able to make it. Uh, his two longest gospel meetings. One was in Sherman, Texas, and this me meeting began on January 3rd, 1894, and it closed on June 7th. It lasted five months and four days. During this particular time, he preached 333, 300, yeah, 333 sermons. He preached twice every day and three times on Sunday. There were over 200 people in Sherman, Texas that came to know the Lord because of that meeting. Now, remember, he's doing all of his sermons without notes. 
333 sermons with no duplicates. His next longest meeting was conducted at Los Angeles, California, and that meeting began on January the 3rd, 1895, and closed on April 17th, three months and 14 days. Over 120 people were baptized, and again, he followed his usual program of three times on Sunday, and two times on every other day. He always preached at a place until no one arrived uh, to hear the message of God. So what do we need to know about T.B. Laramore? First of all, he was a peacemaker. People tried to draw T.B. Laramore into the debates, uh, into the contentions. They tried to get him into the wars that were going on, and he said he had his father's work to do, and he was going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and help people find salvation. He was a schoolmaster. He started schools. He taught people not only Bible. Uh, the two books that he liked to use was Webster's Dictionary and the Bible. He said if you could master words of, of the English language, you could learn what your Bible said. He was a revivalist. Six months out of the year of those first 17 years at Mars Hill, he was on the road preaching. After that, he was preaching on the road full time. He was a man of meekness. His words were soft. He was not overly forceful from the pulpit, but that didn't mean that he was weak. He used the force necessary to bring the message home. You see, Lattimore was challenged to take sides in the issues of the day. Uh, he was called out in the Gospel Advocate to, to actually choose sides, and he refused. And one of his comments was, you know, not only do I refuse, but if this is what is going to uh, cause me to lose my way or my way out of the pulpit, it's okay because I am not going to get involved in contentious debates. See, Laramore chose to not respond or be distracted from preaching. He had his mindset on what he needed to do and what his mission was. His epitaph, what, what, what is it? What he would tell you today is if you want to stay on task, carefully avoid all questions that engender or do gender strifes among God's people. He would tell you to preach the word. He would tell you to be about doing your whole duty. Most of all, though, his comment would be, leave the results up to God from whom all blessings flow. See, we today get to live with the choices that were made. In the years following Laramore's funeral, most Church of Christ folks did not know they had come to a junction. They were not aware that they were taking a different road. It felt like they were just going straight ahead, but they had changed the course. They had made a choice. It would be a while, and some would look around and notice the terrain was different. You see, that day there was a pallbearer, and his name was Foy Esco. Wallace Jr. Some of the things that we know about Foy is that he rarely preached as a local minister. But he lived in a progression of towns in Texas. He lived in Lott, Temple, Vernon, Wichita Falls, and Fort Worth. And these cities simply served as home bases for his gospel meeting operation. One of Wallace's few significant works as a local preacher occurred in 1928 to the middle of 1930 
with the Central Church of Christ in Los Angeles, California. But in the middle of 1930, he received the call from Leon B. McQuitty and asked to serve as the editor of the Gospel Advocate in Nashville. So he waged, here are some of the, the things that he is known for. He waged a successful fight to keep premillennialism out of the churches of Christ. Uh, this was one of his most significant and what he put most of his energy into uh, starting around 1930. Wallace also took issue with the writings of David Lipscomb regarding pacifism. Uh, and for the most part, he won. And most members or men members of the Churches of Christ eventually served in the, the military during World War II and the Korean conflict. Wallace, though, was for segregation. And if you want to find a quote that is somewhat disheartening, Here's a quote from him. He further stated that for a white man to share a room with a Negro man was a violation of Christianity itself and of all common decency. He did not believe in the mixing of, of race in the religious context. He would, in, in, in fact, I mean, he, was, uh, he was harsh in in this belief. Yeah. That is harsh. Wallace was, in the beginning, against institutionalism. Uh, that is, the orphan homes, the uh, sending money to college, anything that was a parachurch organization being funded by a church, he was against until 1951. In 1951, his brother Cleo of Lufkin, Texas, his church split over the institutional, non-institution uh, debate. And after that, Brother Wallace was a non-institution believer. Wallace, 1930 to 1950, was a 20-year period. Perhaps no preacher in the Brotherhood was better known for uh, or more universally loved than him. He was the hot ticket item. If you could get Foy Wallace to come to your congregation to preach during this time, you were going to have the biggest crowd that you could muster of Church of Christ folks ever. What folks so <laughs> True. For about four years, early in the 1930s, he was the editor of the Gospel Advocate. In 1934, following the, the stock market crash and all of the depression, Wallace had great personal debt, declared bankruptcy, and at that time resigned from his public position at the Gospel Advocate. Although a few years later, he did come back to Nashville and repay all his debts. After losing or giving up the gospel advocate position, he founded the Gospel Guardian and the Bible Banner, and in his latter years, the Torch. And his last article that he actually had written in 1964 was with the Firm Foundation. Now, the question is, if he was so prolific from 30 to 50, what happened? And although I may not like some of his theology, I do like what he did. In 1952, while at a meeting in Cushing, Oklahoma, he returned to his hotel to find that his wife had had a stroke. He took her to the hospital. <clears throat> In Temple, Texas, to Scott and White, he then uh, looked for places that would be able to help her in her condition. 
Eventually, he found a place in Hot Springs, Arkansas that could work with her and help her to where she could relearn to walk and be functional. And at that time, he resumed his meeting work, but he took her with him to his appointments. If Foy Wallace was going to be preaching after 1950, his wife was going to be there beside him. For over 25 years, they went to meetings with one another. Foy would bring her in, in her wheelchair. He would feed her, and he took care of her. One of the things that happened during this, after 1950, is large churches in the Churches of Christ no longer welcomed him. One of the reasons they no longer welcomed him is his sermons typically lasted over one hour. <laughs> and for the large churches, this would not fly. Oddly enough, though, in the smaller churches where he would go and preach, the listeners would comment afterwards that it was like no time at all had passed from beginning to end. In 1979, he moved to Hereford, Texas to be near his son, Wilson. He developed a blood condition uh, much like hemophilia. He eventually contracted uh, hepatitis from all of the blood transfusions. And at some point, he had a stroke and died on December the 8th, 1979. Nick, you want to close this out? Hardman, Laramore, Wallace, and, and especially Laramore and Wallace, that symbolic passing of the torch from the peacemaker to the pallbearer, uh, a young Foy Wallace Jr. there uh, at Laramore's funeral a contrast and a clash in styles from from you, you go from the peacemaker of Laramore to the much more contentious uh very you know run rough shot over people uh and and even in some cases uh, almost spiteful uh in his tone with others that's what you got with Wallace um you didn't stand up against him Right? With that, without paying a cost. And an, an illustration of this occurs in 1932. Let me introduce you to one more of our brothers, Brother Casey Moser. Uh, Casey Moser, in 1932, published a book. And the, uh, the chapter that I was reading talked about this book, said it was published by the Gospel Advocate Publishing Company. I don't know if that's a typo. My copy here, the publisher, is Gospel Light Publishing Company in Delight, Arkansas. But if it was the Gospel Advocate that first published this, the Gospel Advocate Publishing, guess who was the editor-in-chief at the Gospel Advocate Journal? Well, uh, when this is published, the Gospel Advocate Journal, the magazine, goes on the warpath. Led, of course, by Wallace, but R.L. Whiteside, C.R. Nickel. Uh, they used the Advocate to cast Moser's Peculiar ideas, that's what they call them, his peculiar ideas as universalist, ultra-Calvinist, and contrary to the gospel. Contrary to the gospel is a direct quote there. What was Moser's uh, offense? What was his unpardonable sin? To suggest that righteousness is a gift from God through faith in Christ's work, rather than something resulting from acts of obedience. So I brought my copy here. What are some of these peculiar ideas that Brother Moser was guilty of espousing? Well, here's on page 33. What Christ did saves, not what man does. Amen. What he does, but expresses his reliance for salvation upon what Christ did for him. Uh, this is from 38, page 38. The value of faith or baptism, for example, is not derived from these acts per se, 
but from the object, Christ Jesus. Uh, and then uh, he does have an extended discussion about uh, righteousness. And I found this section here rather interesting. This is page 115. And, and he's talking about the fundamental mistake of the Jewish people in pursuing a, a works righteousness, <laughs> works oriented righteousness. But he has a parenthetical statement here that I can't help but think was aimed directly at Wallace, Whiteside, and Nickel. He says, indeed, it seems to be difficult, even at the present time, for many to grasp the idea of a righteousness that does not depend upon human effort. To them, a righteousness not based on good deeds seems impossible and unreal. One of the things Whiteside says when he's writing in opposition to Moser's book is that very thing. He can't even fathom a righteousness that does not include good deeds. Uh, again, just sampling here, human righteousness. The only kind known to the Jews, the only kind known to many now, is a righteousness resulting from doing the deeds of law. Again, I can't help but think, in the back of his mind, he's got these three fellows in mind. He has an extended discussion about imputation. Attention has already been called to the importance of the principle of imputation under Christ. Just as the disobedience of Adam is imputed to the whole human race, so is the obedience of Christ imputed to those who have faith in him. A little later on, Adam's sin becomes the sin of all mankind, for that all sin. And the obedience of Christ becomes the righteousness of the believer. The believer does not have to depend upon his own imperfect obedience. He pleads the obedience of Christ. But later on, just as Abraham was reckoned righteous, not because of his works, but because of his faith in God, so the sinner is reckoned righteous because of his faith in Christ. Sounds and on, he read Romans. Well, a lot of the quotations are, are just from that. Yeah. He's quoting Romans 5, he's quoting Romans 4, he's quoting yes. Romans 10. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's saturated with Romans all throughout this. Um, and, and so it goes. This is the work that was anathema. What happens as a result of this? Moser had been a regular contributor to the Gospel Advocate. Was. Revoked. That's right, was. Also, he contributed to the Firm Foundation, which is, I mean, that's the Texas tradition, no longer. Uh, he, is, he is not allowed uh, to publish in, in uh, those two magazines in particular. And those are the big ones at the time, right? Um, so Moser, in that regard, pays a heavy price. But... This is also instructive for us because while Wallace and others, they had the big platform and they, they really solidify our ideas about um, premillennialism. That's the big one, right? The, the big debate that Wallace engages in uh, during his time. Uh, and, and a number of other aspects of our faith where we started from with the, the Texas tradition kind of winning out, our ideas about the church. Um, there were those who were there uh, voicing a better way. Uh, that, uh, that was significant. A couple of other things just as we kind of wind down. Um, I know we say no creed but Christ, right? Um, we're, we only want the Bible. Uh, that's it. However, we have had our uh, catechisms. All right. Uh, if if Hardman produces the works that, if you want to go a little deeper, you can dive into it with the five volumes. C. R. Nickel had uh, he published with Whiteside uh, several volumes. They're called Sound Doctrine. All right. So so you have the, the the foundation there. The basic catechism was right here by Brother Leroy Brown's uh, Brownlow. Why I am a member of the Church of Christ. This. Uh, published in 1945, becomes one of these standard texts that circulates and is a bestseller within our brotherhood uh, for around the next 20 years, although, I mean, you can still find a copy of it. But then you have the updated edition. Introducing the Church of Christ. Uh, this was published in the 80s. Over 50 of our preachers submitted articles, and, and very, very rich in that Texas flavor. Uh, there's a chapter in here, I've got it marked, um, about uh, the church contends that God's kingdom was established on Pentecost 33 AD, which would be equating the church with the kingdom, which is, that's straight from Texas. 
the tradition. So, um, but a number of other things in there uh, as well that kind of embody that. Uh, again, no creeds, but we do have our catechisms, if you will, about what we believe and why we believe what we believe uh, and those sorts of things. So, widely circulated. In fact, uh, here in the opening pages, it talks about the number of publications this has gone through. Uh, even when this particular edition was published, the fifth printing, and we're looking at well over 250,000 copies of this had circulated Brotherhood-wide. Uh, and uh, that is uh, one of the key texts when it comes to uh, understanding what we believe uh, in Churches of Christ, generally speaking. All right, uh, that's... That's, uh, I think, going to do it for our church history uh, course of study. Where, would, where did we begin? Way back, a few months ago, we started off talking about why even study church history. One, two of the main points that I brought up at the time were we want to avoid kind of this historical amnesia where we, we don't remember the things that have gone before, right? And, and Buddy will contend, I'll say it as well, amen, I didn't know a lot of this stuff about our own movement, right? Uh, but it, it's not only very interesting, it helps us understand where we've come from so that hopefully we can move forward uh, to where we're going. Uh, historical amnesia, and then the other thing was chronological snobbery, kind of this idea that what went before, really, it's just prologue. What really matters is right now. And especially in Churches of Christ, we have a real ahistorical view uh, the church was established in 33 AD. You had the great apostasy. Everybody's getting it wrong until we came along, and ding, we've cracked the code thanks to Stone and Campbell, even though, again, we really don't know that much about us. And in certain circles, their salvation is suspect because of some of the stuff that they believed, right? I mean, that whole post-millennial idea that Campbell had, I don't know about... But we want to avoid those things. Uh, so that, again, knowing our roots and knowing why it is we are where we are right now, uh, we can move forward to that vision that Christ had and that he prayed for concerning unity within the church. All right, let's pray about this. Lord God, whether we realize it or not, we do stand on the shoulders of giants. And the ripples in the waters that we swim in are substantial. In fact, uh, many times they're, they're waves, tidal waves even, of the influence and impact they've had within churches of Christ. We pray, Father, that we're able to recognize these things, appreciate these individuals for who they were in the times that they lived, and let them be who they were, and also recognize uh, that we, like them, are imperfect in our obedience, and we must rely upon Christ in all things. Christ truly is our all in all. Yes. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.